Anthem Blue Cross and Common Threads are helping schools across the country learn about healthier food preparation. And here in L.A., they're joined by the Sparks and will provide education, recipes, and knowledge to students and families about healthier options. Learn more at anthem.com slash CA slash Sparks. Anthem Blue Cross is the trade name of Blue Cross of California. Check out great deals throughout the store at Safeway. This week at Safeway, get mega packs of USDA Choice Boneless Beef Chuck Roast for $3.97 per pound with digital coupon limit two packages. Plus, Hass Avocados are 10 for $10 member price. And get Fuji Apples for just 77 cents per pound with digital coupon. Also this week at Safeway, get selected varieties of Lucerne Milk Gallons for the member price of $3.99 each when you buy two. Visit Safeway.com or head into your local store for more deals. Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibis? Happy Friday. It's the weekend. Like, it's officially here. Super excited, even though tomorrow I have to get up early. My son has driver's ed. And Sunday morning, early, set your DVRs if you're not awake, 7.30, I will be on Court TV to talk about Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell case. Super excited, super nervous. All right, we have two days of testimony to cover because yesterday was really kind of a quarter day for me as far as the Wagner trial went. It was just a lot of repetitive ballistic stuff that they found at Peterson Road, and then they broke early. So there just wasn't enough to do an episode last night. Then the news broke about Lori's competency. So I jumped on that and said, well, this is kind of enough for a longer episode. So we're going to jump in real quick before we get started. Music fact of the day, the song Wake Me Up When September Ends by Green Day. Great, great song. The video is about a young couple and the man enlisted in the Marines and was sent to the Iraq War. But the song was actually written about the lead singer, Billy Joe Armstrong's father's death on September 1st, 1982, when he was just 10. That is horrible. Just, I can't imagine. I still have my dad and I'm middle-aged and can't imagine losing him, especially that young. Um, also, thanks to, I've had a lot of locals from Pike County who apparently listen. So just a big thank you. I've had people email me that knew the rodents and it's really been cool to hear some stories about them. And they've also given me a little schooling on some stuff. It's not pebbles, it's peebles. So apparently I've been saying that wrong. And I had somebody who is very much uh, in the know about pill mills. So those are ran with a real licensed doctor, although they're pretty shady. And uh, some of those doctors have complaints on their li licenses, but they didn't accept insurance. It's cash only. They would schedule patients every two to three minutes. So you would go in, tell the doctor something, like I've got anxiety. So they would write prescriptions for nar narcotics. So they would get like 180 Percocets a month with some Valium or Xanax to go with it, which can be lethal if you combine that or take too much, obviously. I know it's been an epidemic all over the country and especially in this area of the country. Uh, prescriptions were refilled without question every month. And as long as you paid cash, you were good. No tests were done. There was nothing assessed to see if the medications were effective. And so you would have people that would continually ask for something stronger because your tolerance builds up and all that. So... Um, some filled the prescriptions on site. And if you had two to $300 a month cash, you could walk away with thousands of dollars in your pocket, either to take or sell. So it was from a doctor. So you know who you are. Thank you for writing in about that. And to everybody who's given me some little personal stories about the Wagners, I do appreciate it. Some of which I probably won't share on here because, you know, people just, um, reach out and talk, and that's cool with me. So yesterday, we started off with, and on the top right screen, if you're watching on YouTube, on the left are yesterday's witnesses. There were only two. And so the first witness was Brian White. From He was formerly with BCI. I don't think he's with him now, but he's a, he was a crime scene agent. And he was there on the May 10th, 2017 initial search of Peterson Road, which was that really, really small kind of look everything over search that the media was not alerted to and they were able to do just small scale. And then what they saw, if you remember, kind of triggered that second bigger search warrant. 
So he took photos outside of the property, the residence, and the barns. By the way, before we get into all this, a few things that I said I was going to put up here. Some pictures of the Wagners in Alaska back before they were arrested and they thought they, I don't know if they knew they got away with it. At this point, they probably knew that, you know, these search warrants had happened. The kids' pictures, their faces are blurred out. I just don't like showing, um, I know I did with Ruger, but I accidentally had the wrong picture up. So sorry about that, but I don't like to show minors. Uh, But you can see them probably, looks like Walmart shopping carts. I mean, Angela, Lord have mercy, that woman. And then on the bottom left, you see Jake here holding a little Sophia from behind. And then on the right, you got Billy looking like a wannabe meatloaf from Rocky Horror and Jake looking a little skinny and worried. Then this next picture, um, Hannah Mae, a lot of their social medias are public. So I'm okay showing this. This picture of Jake and Hannah Mae when she was obviously pregnant with Sophia where he's like upside down in a tree kissing her belly like Spider-Man creeps me out. Uh, Hannah Mae looks super cute, but just knowing his the age difference and like she's just 15. Oh man. All right. So back to what we were talking about. So um, Agent White, he took photos all around and they took uh, panoramics as well. So just some inside photos of the residents. The The basement on Peterson Road looks like something straight out of a horror movie. It's like you see this scene right before you start getting chased by somebody. I'm not even kidding, y'all. I'm going to put the link in the description to these photos. If you're just listening, please go look. Because, y'all, this, this basement is like the stuff nightmares are made of. I wouldn't have went down there like with two people with me. Because that's how you end up, you know running from somebody in a horror movie. The kitchen, um, they like red a lot. So, uh, yeah, just, okay. And then the upstairs, this is obviously, you know, after they've moved out, and then you have the living room, which was super, super small. Um, Anyways, all right. So they did gather evidence that first day from outside, but it wasn't a big search. It was just, it was just visual. But then, so the evidence that they found, I mean, gosh, y'all, they had enough spent shell casings on that property. If I had a dollar for everyone, I could retire and go to Key West. They found 22 rimfire ammo, 22 rimfire cartridges, nine millimeter fired cartridge cases. They found documents in the trash outside the home, live 22 round in the cabinet in the kitchen. All that evidence was taken to the BCI lab in a, they have this zip bag full of shell casings. So the 22 caliber, if you remember when the agent was there in the driveway talking to Jake, he looked down and saw that the casings looked very similar to what they had found at the crime scene. So he he knew. And then they found out the Wagners are moving. And the day that, it, you know, that the house was emptied and before the new owners came in, they did the small one. And then BCI compares the shell casings from the scene to these they found on that really small search. After the findings, boom, like big search warrant, call in the Calvary. And that happens on May 12th, 2017. And this was just a bigger search. They needed a lot of manpower. Obviously, it wasn't kept quiet. I remember seeing news articles about this search warrant. On the Yeah, it was big. So they used the STAR team, BCI agents, deputies from Pike County, Adams County. They used rake, shovels, sifters, tools. They did a line search where they walked shoulder to shoulder. If they saw something, they would put a flag down. And then he would uh, put a placard there and then take the picture so um this is one picture from the main barn area in the bottom middle that is not a screenshot from the walking dead those guys in the background totally look like looks like that could be a promo for the walking dead but you see all the flags so they find all this um i'm just going to save us a lot of time and just say there were shell casings all over the place but other than the cartridges they recovered a burned DVR from the fire pit. And inside the barn, they found a cistern that was filled in and covered up. They decided to have a dive team actually come in later and go inside there. So it was a really quick testimony. Um, I mean, it wasn't quick. It was just so much ballistic evidence that 
I, I mean, it, it took hours for him just to go through what they found and where. So on cross-exam, it was Parker up. I'm going to tell you, today, y'all, he made my blood pressure go up. We'll get to that at the end of this episode. So Parker says, the burned electronic, do you know where it came from, how long it was there? No. With all the shell casings, some of those were collected by others and turned over to you. These were searches in May 2017, just a year after the crimes. There was a lot of speculation about what happened. Law enforcement had pref press conferences keeping the public informed. Let's review some photographs. So he shows an aerial photo of Peterson. I didn't put that on here because it just wasn't clear. wasn't a good quality picture. And he asked if he knew how old that aerial photo was, and White said no. He also asked, have you ever been to the end of Peterson Road? Are you aware it's a dead end? And he said no. You have to understand, this property, we get to it later, but it's it's acres and acres. It's like 20-something, maybe more acres of land. There's no way they could have searched every inch of this property that'd still be out there today. And the unfinished barn, there was an unfinished barn. It just didn't have... Um, it's this barn here, I believe. Um, there was one barn that just literally was, a, it was just the shell of it. But in, um, in the unfinished barn, that's not this picture. Did you notice power lines or cell towers? And he said, no. He said, in the new barn, did you take any measurements? And he said, no. In the new barn they had, it had some stables in it for animals and then he said, those shell casings you found are common brands. And on May 12th, the second search, you had a metal detector. You started searching around 125 in the afternoon. And White said, I thought it was earlier. And then the defense asked, when did you finish? And he said, around 6 or 7 in the evening. Oh, okay, here. Did you go through all 70 acres of land? I was way off. And he said, no. By the way, Parker's voice reminds me of some actor. I think it's maybe like Joe Pesci without the New York accent. I'm still trying to nail it. If you guys have thought of something, let me know because it's driving me bonkers. So on redirect, there were many more shell casings than what I presented to you today. He said, yes. She said, you were asked about media attention with respect to the first look on May 10th. Were you trying to avoid the media finding out? Was part of that reason so the Wagners wouldn't know you'd been there? And he said, yes. And then she said, the 22 long rifle that was sent to BCI, were they mixed in with other casings that had similar wear? And he said, yes. And then on the 12th, the media learned you were out there. And he said, yes. I mean, it's kind of hard to avoid that. You know, you've got, I mean you've got a ton of cars at Peterson. Everybody local knows the Wagners just moved. Of course, it's going to be something they talk about. Small town, big town. The next witness was Matt White with BCI from Ballistics, um, the dude with the killer beard. And, <clears throat> excuse me. So, the prosecution said, was one of your opinions that one of the weapons responsible for the casings found at the scene was a forty caliber? And he said, yes. He determined the shell casings could have been fired by a Glock and determined it was a second-generation Glock. And also, a 22 was used. He determined the 22 was a Walther Colt 1911 22 pistol. If you remember, he even talked to the uh, manufacturers in Germany. And then somebody there at BCI had a gun similar and, and was able to sort of verify it gives this unique marking. So from scene one, which would be Chris and Gary... A 30 caliber weapon was used and determined it was a 762 by 39. The projectiles recovered from scene one was likely fired from an SKS. So they give the investigator a list of, of guns from Jake's phone, and there were a ton. The SKS was likely used, and then the Colt 1911 22. Now, George's attorneys did not <clears throat> did not want that coming in, obviously, because it had George as being the, the one that had the SKS. And if you remember, according to Jake's confession, at Chris and Gary's scene, when they were hiding under the truck, George had that SKS, but according to Jake, he froze and couldn't shoot. So, the, But the most likely were the SKS and the Colt, Colt 1911. And he did comparisons of the 22 calibers from scenes two and three, which is Frankie and Dana's. All fired 22s have been fired from the same firearm compared to the shell casings from Peterson Road searches. 
And they were all from the same gun. And as soon as he made that determination, he immediately told investigators. So what happens? There was another search warrant filed. Matt White went to the scene this time to assist and give this, you know, his expertise and to give agents sort of an idea of what would need to be tested and what wouldn't just due to the sheer volume of the different types of shell casings on that property. It was insanity. Um, in fact, I've got some pictures of the casings. And I mean, this is just like one tiny little area where they find all these casings. So he did um, follow up comparisons of additional 22 caliber cartridges found at this search. And then he did comparisons to those and found all of the 22 caliber cartridges were fired from the same pistol. So on cross, the, the only question they could say is, do you know who fired that weapon? No. It's important to properly dispose of unwanted medication or sharps. MedProject offers free and convenient disposal options near you. To learn more, call 844-MEDPROJECT or visit medproject.org. So we go to today. So now we're, we're back to today. That's literally all I could kind of get out of there yesterday without having you guys sit through a two-hour episode with an hour and a half of that being all about ballistics. So it was uh, Special Agent Fortner was up, and they are talking about doing, on May 12th, 2017, he was at the search warrant at the Wagner's homes, and he went to where they stored the trucks and trailers. So this search warrant, the last one, I guess, on the property was for the trucks they found and the trailers attached, which essentially had... I think everything the Wagners owned stuffed to like the gills. It was, it was, there was stuff everywhere. There was a large silver trailer that was empty. There were two pickup trucks with tra trailers attached. And then you had two trailers that were unattached. And then there were padlocks on all the doors. So they brought, uh, they, they brought in like a lock breaker and unloaded the trailers. So they found, um, just in a lot of the, the gosh, there was stuff everywhere, y'all. Um, trying to, I've got this little thing here that helps me put, um, helps me put things up on the scene, up on the screen, rather. And then sometimes it just gets really confusing for me. So I apologize. Um, so they found some camo ghillie suits, some bullets. In a wooden chest, they also found an Acer computer, firearm-related materials, a tote with several trail cameras in it, which is interesting because we know that there were some trail cameras that were taken from the Roden residences, but also it's not unimaginable that they would have, you know, um, trail cameras at their, at their house because they got 70 acres. They found newspapers, though. Get this. It's almost like a serial killer who takes little souvenirs. With the headline, Pike County, all we've got left is those kids after the murders. So they're talking about, they didn't say whose quote that was. I believe it was probably, you know, Dana or the Rodin's family members. But they had several newspapers, I guess, about the murders. In the floorboard of the gray Dodge Ram, and that belonged to Jake, they found a black ski mask. I'm going to tell you guys right now, I'm going to see this thing in my nightmares. They found ski masks, uh, three different ones. They also found there was a Garmin GPS and a CB inside that truck. So this is Jake's truck on the screen. In a crate from that Dodge Ram, they found a box with miscellaneous paperwork, document from law offices to Jake Wagner. They found the Walmart receipt in West Union, Ohio, from some electronics. And um, one of those was a camera kit, which is um, like surveillance that has the DVRs. They found mobile phones, electronic items. The camera kit was $299, and they bought a service plan, which, you know, you kind of wonder, is that the one they found in the fire pit or maybe the one that they stole from, um, I believe it was Chris Sr.'s that had the DVR that was missing. Um, dated, so that was dated, um, March 17th, 2016. Um, he pulls out the receipt in the envelope and they didn't take it, but they took a photo of it in case they needed it. 
They also searched a large open air trailer. They found Samsung cell phones, uh, a TomTom Tom GPS, Kodak camera, a tote with camouflage clothing, two trail cameras, a Glock 17 gun case. And then they found a notepad with writing, y'all. This is some creepy stuff right here. Um, let's see here. Um, four SD memory cards, sorry, a Caldwell brand brass catcher. And the prosecutor says, if I have a brass catcher on a semi-auto rifle and went to fire that rifle, would it catch shell casings to keep them from being found? And he says, that's exactly what it's designed for. They found locks with a lock pick set, firearm accessories, a Glock grip, magazine loader, Samsung and Motorola cell phones, Six other SD cards, six flash drives, Verizon jetpack. They found footwear. There was a laundry basket with some small items like a VCUS bank card that belonged to Jake, a drum magazine, and a wood stock. Apple iPad box, Sleuth Gear brand bug detector. So that's kind of um, a big deal because we know that the bug detector, according to Jake, was bought to try to find out, you know, it, it detects wireless signals like cell phones, trail cameras, things like that. A black iPhone, a silver cell phone, and an easy pass. Then they found the Walmart Waverly receipt, which is where Angela buys the shoes for these murders, allegedly. Well, I think she admitted it. So, and allegedly, she did it. So, you see at the bottom here, if you're looking, there's two for athletics, but then there were three purchased, but one was returned. And I'm going to tell you right now, this is how this is going to go. I think that George's lawyer is going to say, how can you prove that George the Fourth, who's on trial wore those shoes when allegedly three people went. That's just where it's going to go. I still am waiting on something big, y'all. Look, here's the thing. I don't care if he pulled the trigger on anybody or not. They knew everything about each other. He went that night. Jake said he went. But he didn't prevent this. And, like, this right here is your final... This is what happened by George's compliance with the plan. And if you're not watching on YouTube, it's a picture from these funerals for the rodents. And this casket's lined up. It almost looks like a display. And sadly, there's just, you know, I mean, a whole family, a whole generation wiped out. So, you know what? You can you can say all you want. Do you know who fired the gun? Well, it don't matter because you were there and you knew. All right. So then they had a black Dodge with a trailer. There was some uh, cell phones, Cabela Club cards that belonged to George, a bill with his name on it that we later find out mommy paid, a Nikon Coolpix camera, some composition notebooks with miscellaneous writings and George's name on it. And I'm going to tell you right now, y'all, this was creepy too because there are some drawings in this notebook. So... We'll get to those drawings in just a second. But, uh, yeah, George's little green composition notebook, it looked like he he doodled like he was in fifth grade trying to draw some tactical gear. In a black trailer, there was a stipulation that pictures were taken by Special Agent Hunter. Another ski mask was found in the tub. So on cross, you don't know who packed each vehicle. You didn't forensic test to see whose DNA was on a particular item? No. The defense says ski mask from... The black gooseneck trailer. Are you saying it's related to the homicides? And he says, I don't know. It was of interest because they're often used in criminal offenses. The defense says there's evidence forthcoming that clothing items were burned by Jake because he told BCI he did. He said he burned them. Um, Parker was in a mood today, y'all. Um, the agent said, I didn't interview him. Ben said the trucks and the trailers weren't hidden. They could be seen from the road. And the agent said, yeah. They were actually on somebody else's property from what I gather from testimony. They weren't even on the Wagner's property. The defense says, what was the big silver trailer? What was it used for? And he said, you know, it looked to be used to haul livestock. And the defense says it was empty. And he said, yes. The defense says it appears whoever loaded those trailers used whatever space they could. And he said, obviously. 
On redirect, the prosecutor says, if I want to avoid detection by committing a crime, that's the kind of mask I might use. And he said, possibly. I've, I've seen it in my career. Then she asks, if I cover my face, hair, and all that, that could prevent my DNA from being shed. Did it take you a long time to unload all that stuff? And he said, seven hours or more. So then there's more cross. If someone's going to wear a ski mask, they wouldn't need to dye their hair. Which is, okay, so I'm going to give Parker a point there. It's a good point. And the agent said, probably not. Their head would be covered. But, you know, you got to think about it from like a killer's point of view. What if my ski mask gets ripped off and it's dark? So maybe if my hair is dark, they might not recognize me. I don't know. I'm just trying to think like an evil killer. But anyways, this next witness, Julia Eva Slage. I think I said that wrong. I probably said it wrong. Bless her heart, because cross-exam was brutal, and we'll get to that. But she was at the search warrant to look through documents at the big one where they went through the trailers. And they start with George's black Dodge Ram. So she's given the green notebook with Edward Wagner's name printed on the front in, like, handwriting. So there is a secret spy case drawing show, showing a stick figure with two cult, or not a stick figure, two cult handguns, two cult suppressors, a tool kit, a cleaning kit, ammo, clips, and two flashlights. The drawing from the green notebook was taken from George's truck, and it had his name on it. So, I mean, yeah. There was another one that said close combat gear, and it had a cell phone, a uh, cantana, knives, clips, a spare pouch, two Colts. Um, and then there was a Keltec 12 gauge on the back of the, uh, on the right side of that picture, if you're looking. There was drawings of blueprints with dimensions in four rooms that included a six foot hallway which to me, obviously, is the inside of somebody's house. I would love to know the layout of the inside of all the houses to see. I'm telling you, the one on the bottom left looks like a trailer to me, like a, you know, maybe where Kenneth lived because it's, it's just like two, three rooms. You have your, yeah, that's what I think that is. Then you have a gray notebook, phone number on the front, iPad, Airbox, activation for a Verizon cell phone number, and a security code on the front. There was a Gmail account with Angela's password. Her password, guess what it was? Bullvine Sophia. So original. Writing by Angela at the bottom, and it says George's attorney has, and it has a name. There's a bill ledger handwritten with household bills. And so these were, okay, number one, the cameraman from today needs to be fired because he made my job hard. I have my magnifying glass out, y'all, literally trying to look at this stuff. She just obviously hand wrote her bills every month for what was due. So August 2016, let's kind of run through some of these bills. Um, I'm sorry, October 2016, it says Jake's attorney. Note says Jacob and Chris wrecked George's truck of September at 2 a.m. Jay, he had two cracked ribs and Chris had nine fractures and 26 stitches. Obviously, this is not Chris uh, Roden because um, this is October 2016. The November bills, phone number for Billy was on there. It was just random bills and expenses. Then this is kind of what I'm curious about because in July, it has passports paid $900. December of 2016, there were fees for attorneys. And then that the attorney fees were for Jake, for Sophia. And, it, and again, passports, $800. January 2017, it says passports, $900, and then some more attorney fees. There were a lot of items with different prices, and she said it could be sales they made. And the prosecutor asked if she's familiar with them selling things because she saw this going through their Facebook accounts where you sell on like Facebook Marketplace or local little, you know, sell groups. October is National Eczema Awareness Month. According to the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, while it's usually thought of as a childhood disease, around 16.5 million adults in the U.S. have eczema. While it affects people in various ways, 51.3% of adults with atopic dermatitis, otherwise known as AD, the most common form of eczema, say it limits their lifestyle. 39% says it causes them to avoid social interaction because of their appearance, and 43% says it affects their activities. Luckily, as you know, Gladskin is here to help. 
As a parent, it's hard to see your child struggle with itchiness and discomfort from eczema. You're probably hesitant to try new products like I was when my baby had eczema, and you just want the best for your baby. Thankfully, GladSkin is safe and gentle on your baby's skin. Parents, if your child has eczema, know that you're not alone. Childhood eczema is really common, and lots of family and kids struggle with dry, inflamed, and itchy skin. And you're probably wary of strong medications and creams, rightfully so. But now there's GladSkin, which is steroid-free and clinically proven to reduce eczema symptoms safely and quickly. GladSkin's new oatmeal-free formula is non-toxic and free of steroids and other common irritants. Pediatricians and dermatologists love GladSkin for even the littlest of babies. So if you've been frustrated with your treatment options, don't wait to try GladSkin. They're offering my listeners 15% off plus free shipping on your first order at gladskin.com slash what the world. That's gladskin.com slash what the world for 15 off plus free shipping. Gladskin.com slash what the world. With no fees or minimums and no overdraft fees, banking with Capital One is the easiest decision in the history of decisions. Even easier than choosing to keep the Grinch away from the toy drive. Who's going to deliver the toys to the kids? What about me, the Grinch? No. Yep, even easier than that. You steal the presents one time. With no fees or minimums and no overdraft fees, is it even a decision? That's banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. Capital One and a member FDIC. Copyright Dr. Seuss Enterprises. Copyright Turner Entertainment Company. Lucky Land Casino. Asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. February 2017, there were more attorney payments and then another passport, $750. There were some expenses for animals. March of 2017, there was a big note. It says, get ready to leave March 2017. And then it says, do this the day we leave. But she didn't write what they were doing the day they leave. So in the tote from George's truck, on top of the paperwork, there is a declaration of appointment of guardian in the event of my death or incapacity. This is the one forged from Christmas Day 2014. Allegedly, it was, you know with the one that they faked Hannah Mae's signature giving Jake custody. They had three different copies of the form filled out, and it says, I, Hannah Mae Roden, make this declaration to appoint as my guardian for my child or children in the event of my death or incapacitation, list Edward Jake Wagner. And then it goes on, you know. At the bottom, there's the website, which says texasprobate.forms.dgminer. And the morons didn't even look at the bottom of the paper and see that it tells you when you printed it, which was April 2nd, 2016, 20 days before the murders. Second page was notarized and signed again with Hannah Mae's signature, fake signature, and you had uh, Angela's mom, Rita Newcomb's forged signature. They found two other copies with the same website and printed date on the bottom of 2016, one for Jake naming Angela as the guardian for Sophia, that was backdated to March 11, 2015, the same for George giving bovine to Angela. There were typed written letters from Tabitha to George. And if you remember, Tabitha said she put one in the mailbox and mailed one to him. And it says, George, I spoke with my attorney and he informed me of my rights. And this is what he advised me to do. I will be at your home to pick up bovine for my visits on every Wednesday from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. starting April 1st, 2015. I will be at your house April 10th at 6 for my first visit and return bovine Sunday for my first weekend visit, followed by every other weekend, as do my rights, so forth as the non-residential parent in accordance with Ohio laws. I'm also sending a copy of this letter to the courts as advised by my attorney, and then she gives her new address and phone number. They also show a, a handwritten note, which was dated April 18th that didn't have a year on it. It's to her attorney. It says, I came to visit Bolvine and give him his Easter basket and you weren't home. I'll be back next Wednesday on the 15th of April at 5.30 p.m. There was also a printed Ohio, just kind of standard parenting 50-50 or like, you know, the every other weekend. 
and it circles the non-visitation rights at the bottom. There are a lot of docs about um, the deed and the purchase of the Peterson Road address, and it showed the purchasers were Jake and George. They paid $175,000 cash. It was bought in December 2013, and they took possession in March of 2014. It says 23 acres, but the defense attorney said 70. There was a job resume for Jake. A, I don't know where some of this stuff's going to come in. A shamrock tattoo business card. Maybe that's where they both got their uh, wedding rings tattooed on their fingers. Invoice from Pine Top Construction with four prices for work done at the Peterson residence. They traded five guns worth $1,800 and the total amount for the work done there was 5060 Lots of tax documents for Jake, George IV, and Angela. There was a lot of other documents that just belonged to all the Wagners. And two letters from insurance, it was for uh, the business, the trucking business. The custody documents, as we know, were sent for handwriting analysis. And there's a metal box with a clipboard on top that contains some paperwork. It had a copy, get this, of Tabitha's driver's license and social security card from September of 2016, which is odd because they were divorced. And I don't know if it's something she voluntarily gave, but I don't think you'd give all that stuff in a divorce. There was a tub labeled important files taken out of Jake's truck, and they found photocopies of Facebook conversations between Tabitha and uh, Hannah Mae, also Hannah Mae and Tess. And so the um, the stack of those guys was unreal. It was just a huge, huge stack of papers. It was hundreds of pages that they had printed out of these private conversations with Hannah Mae, Tabitha, and her mom. And they didn't go through them. They just showed the sheer volume of what they had. These people were, and I'm going to tell you right now, Angela is Fifty Shades of Grey. She, I think she's like the, she is the ringleader of all this. She was the one that was obsessed, I think. Uh, it's just insane that you can convince three other people to do what they did. I, I don't want to say convince because they all went willingly, but still. There was a law office billing about uh, custody regarding Sophia. There was a sidebar about that. There were four pages total. They were stapled in twos together. It begins June 5th, 2015, and then April 23rd, 2016, one day after the bodies were found, one day after they murdered the Roden family. It says, in reference to shared parenting of one child, the next line says, after the death of Hannah Mae Roden changed to custody of child slash companionship of one child. April 23rd, now companionship, I looked it up in Ohio, and I... As far as I can tell, companionship has something to do with grandparents, like visitation rights of grandparents. It says, in reference to the shared parenting of one child, um, I'm sorry, yeah, so April 23rd, the day after the murders, there was a telephone conference re regarding the death of Hannah Mae. It says death, it should say murder, and custody of one child. June 14th, 2016, it lists a deposit of $1,000 from Jake, and also the billable hours begin on June 15th. The initial meeting, and then just their ongoing billing from there. August 25th, 2015, it says there was a meeting with the attorney, Jake, and Hannah Mae to review documents. Again, Jake, Hannah Mae, and his lawyer on November 11th, 2015, they did the same. Had a meeting with his attorney. So Walmart, April 7th, 2015, at 4.58 p.m., we know that that's when Angela went and bought the shoes. They were $13.97 each. Um, they knew of the Walmart shoes at this point when they got the surveillance pictures. So they were super interested, you know, obviously to see what else they had. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the car pulling out and leaving there's somebody in the passenger seat. Uh, doesn't look like Angela. It looks like somebody's wearing lighter clothes. There was a court of common pleas mail from Pike County Department of Job and Family Services sent to Peterson Road for Jake. <clears throat> and that was 
June 15th, 2016, in order to appear on June 23rd, 2016 for DNA testing, this was for paternity testing for Kylie, the five-day-old. Eventually, the results, as we know, it says non-existence of father and child relationship. Results of the DNA, obviously, it, not his kid. They show another Walmart receipt, uh, March 17th, 2016, 9.20 p.m. That's when that camera kit with the DVR was bought for $299. Um, they found a three-page typed document with an outside the envelope saying Sophie. And it was... Um, just a 50-50 custody is just your standard co-parenting custody agreement like uh, every other weekend, every other holiday, Mother's Day with the mother, that kind of thing. But here's the thing. This type document was from Jake because they later established he, he really can't spell to save his life. There was no, okay, these were Jake's rules, right? These, this is no daycare and babysitting is only Dana and Angela. <clears throat> they talk about taxes, they say that any kind of child tax credit they got would be put in a college fund for Sophia. She would be homeschooled by a teacher, teacher meaning Angela, of course, paid for by Jake, and her schooling will be 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Monday through Thursday. Medical would be 50-50 decision. Religion, she would be raised on Jake's religious belief. Environmental safety, it says they can't go places considered unsafe by one parent. They must discuss the issue until it's agreed upon, which is super convenient because uh, one thing we know is that Angela blocked Hannah Mae because she couldn't stand seeing her with um, Corey because her picture has Corey and um, Sophia and Hannah Mae looking all happy. So the prosecution talks about the numerous typos and compares it to Jake's resume, which they found, and say it's the same font, same typos, and there's an objection, and they kind of go back and forth for a little bit. There was a, a flyer for Judgment Day Extreme Mud Race, come test your abilities, and it was put on by the Wagners. January 5th, 2015, it was a, notif a notice of action of application for Medicaid denied for Jake Let's see, Jake, George, and um, Vine, his little boy. Jake failed to provide income information. George reapplied in 2015, and he included his income pay stubs. He said he got paid monthly from George Wagner Trucking, but didn't get paid for July. Says his wife left the home November 11th. It also says, I have um, Bull Vine, my son, 100% of the time. I'm the one with full custody. Tabitha does not keep him at her house for any amount of time. They were also leasing their some of their property for hunting. They read this lease agreement. And, and they're just really showing with this lease agreement that it's Jake that did all the typing for the family, clearly, because Knucklehead didn't know how to spell check, apparently. So August 27, 2010, it says that they have some letters from Hannah Mae. They're handwritten that they, in 2010, Dear Edward, I'm so glad I met you. I thank God for you every day. I know you think I write very funny. I cannot have the notebook up straight. I have to have it sideways. Don't laugh at me, monkey. Love you, Hannah. There was no date on the next one. It says, I love you, babe. Love, Hannah. One they didn't put up, which is why it's not on screen. July 18th, 2012. It says, Edward Wagner with a smiley face. I love you with all my heart. I can't wait until we get married and start a family. I hate when we fight and argue because it hurts me and you. I'm bored. I'm just writing you because I can't talk to you. Sleep tight. Love you. Hope you find this in your wallet, love. Hannah Mae Wagner, sleepy, crazy boy, you know I love you. There are copies of 12 pages of claims and policy numbers for Jake and George of things purchased, which include antiques. I'm wondering if that's maybe not like a list, because if you remember Tabitha said when they burned the house down, they went and got, Angela went and got a bunch of receipts to fill out. And um, they faked what they had lost in the house to get the money. So then they start going into these 12-month calendars. There's two separate calendars for the year 2015. You had some kind of antique calendar, and then you had a farmer's almanac calendar. And essentially, Angela was writing a lot of notes about things about Sophia. Clearly things they were doing, marking dates where little things would happen or whatever to use against Hannah Mae in some kind of a 
some kind of a custody battle. March 27th, this is all 2015. Sophie was brought here this afternoon, staying until Sunday morning, and it says Colt Ford Concert. I remember seeing online Hannah Mae went to a Colt Ford Concert. I couldn't find it. I looked. Try to put it up. April 7th, Hannah Mae's birthday, May 2nd. Sophia had a black and blue bump above her ear. All kids have black and blue little bumps on them. Uh, May 16th, Sophia had the top of her ear severely bruised. May 29th, Sophia has second-degree burns to right side pinky finger. June 14th through the 17th, Sophia had allergic reaction to something rash on her leg all over. So in June, it was just kind of that every other week writing, you know, it's Jake's weekend, Jake's weekend, Hannah's weekend, Hannah's weekend. July, same rotation of weekends were written down. July 25th, Hannah brought Sophie down about 1.30 or 2. Jake told her she could keep her longer this Saturday, but she said she had something to do. Brought her early. August 14th, Dana pick, picked up, and then she, the girl couldn't read what was said there. It said 12 noon, $250. August 19, Hannah has tests. Watch Suds, which we know is Sophie's nickname. I think Suds is a really cute nickname, by the way. August 21st, got Sophia early today instead of on Saturday. September, still alternating those weekends. Uh, on the 1st of September, Sophia left today. September 3rd, two still in 2015, Jake had suds today, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Hannah had a funeral and went home and fell asleep. September 4th, Jake went and got suds tonight. September 5th, Sophie here. September 23rd, took Sophie to Hannah's. Jake went to West Union to pick up pick Sophie back up. And then in the notes section at the bottom, it says, Jake has been taking Sophie to Hannah and picking Sophie up every time they change, even on Hannah's days. She works and has Jake watch Sophie. She has not paid any of the expenses. So on that second calendar, October 14th, 2015, Jake got suds so Hannah could see her boyfriend. And in parentheses, it says, get ready for sugar test, new baby. That's probably that glucose tolerance test. If you've had a baby, you know what I'm talking about, and it stinks. October 16th, Jake picked up Sud so Hannah could go to the hospital where Frankie, baby, being born. So this must have been when Ruger was being born. November 9th, 2015, drove by Dana's. Sophie was with Dana and Bobby Joe. November 15th was Sophie's party. They show a handwritten note. I didn't see them actually read it on the screen, though, but it said, because I paused it. When Jake got there, Dana was asleep, and I think it said Hannah was in the bed with the covers over her head. Sophie and Brentley were running around. It said passing, I think it said passing water all over the floor, trash, dirty diapers everywhere. So she said that, then the witness said that she did some more work on that Walmart receipt. They had paper copies of the surveillance. She went and got the physical copies, and that's the ones that, uh, that we see with Angela there buying the murder shoes. This poor girl on cross, it was Parker. And I'm going to tell you right now, Parker, Parker, oh my gosh, my blood pressure, y'all, was high. I felt so bad for this poor girl. She's awesome. Like, she's a great witness. I really, really like her. The defense said, did you write a report about your activities on this day where she went to that big search with the trailer? She said no. So the defense here, I'm going to tell you, all right, so this sort of like makes sense um, to me. He was, he pointed this out. He asked to look at the calendar and he notes that they're separated and they're not joined. So he asks her to pull up the month of October and there's two versions for 2015 because there's two calendars. And for like 30 hot seconds, he couldn't have this compute in his little brain. One is blank. He And he says there's two different calendars in one exhibit. Now, I noticed this. Him and Nash were at the defense table with Wagner, shaking their heads like they were just um, in disbelief when they were doing the calendar part. The prosecution says, if you want to mark them separate, we can do that. But he literally makes a point to stand there and mark the exhibits for the prosecution. So he said, let's look at the one with the red label. There's nothing written in October. And he, she said, not on this one. The defense 
asks about the clear tote and he asks about the item number and she says she doesn't see a marking on the outside and the prosecutor said it's on the bag. The defense talks about that mail from Tabitha to George. He keeps pointing out there's no item number and he asks if that letter came out of that envelope specifically and she said she couldn't say. So it's kind of <clears throat> one of those things where really, you know, it, he's just pointing out that, that this was a little bit of sloppy work done by the prosecutor. It was confusing and it, it got confusing on the stand. But he asked if she made inventory of what was in the tub and she says only what was taken. She said, it's up to crime scene to do inventory. She said, not in my wheelhouse. The defense says, if you see something of interest, you say, set it aside. My job, And she said, my job was just to look for items of actual interest. The defense says, have you looked through this entire tub? And she said, in 2017, I did. Did you look in preparation for your testimony today? And she said, no. So they go back to the letter from Tabitha. There's no signature. He says, this isn't a legal, legal document from court. And also about the receipt, he says, that's not been marked. It appears to be a generic receipt. It's signed by Tabitha, not a legal paper, though. So the receipt is talking about, like, the certified mail. I guess she had him sign for it or something. Um, so I'm going to put up a picture here. I mean, like, you can see he's getting that look, y'all. Uh, she could have shot lasers out right there, and he was just falling back. Um so he talks about the custody agreement sent to George not being a legal document. He said, you identified many handwritten notes. Do you know who wrote any of these? And she said, I can't say for certain. The defense says, you're not a handwriting expert. And then he pulls out that receipt from the construction company. He said, it doesn't identify any person who did the work. You don't know what it's for. And she said, it looks like work performed. And the defense said, did you interview anyone? And she said, it's not my job. And did you prepare a report? And she said the agents prepare investigative reports. That's part of their job description. We don't. The defense says, oh, you go off memory. Oh, y'all, this is when my blood pressure, I felt my ears getting hot. Uh, she said, we take notes and we email. And he said, I'm asking about you in particular. Did you make any notes? She said, there's no report. You're working off your memory. And she said, at this present time, yes. So they go to the Klinger Tax Service, and he marks the exhibit apparently. It's not marked. And to George, it says it's to George, and it lists tax information from Ohio. Doesn't have a year. Doesn't say if it's George Wagner the third or George Wagner the fourth. And the defense says, did you come to understand George had his own bank account? And she said, I know he shares one with Jake. The defense says, you're not aware of one of his own? And the defense, and she says, no. And the defense says, are you aware George had his own credit cards? And she said, yes. And I'm going to tell you right now, his mommy paid him because on her list of monthly bills, she had George's little Cabela card included. So January 30th, um, I'm sorry, there was a Klinger tax 2016 returns for George. Um, then January 30th of 2015, law office to George Wagner it was Wagner versus Wagner. He says, read it to me. I swear to God, I think it's Joe Pesci without a New York accent, y'all. Y'all go listen and tell me. Uh, he says he, he has her read it. Essentially, it's the final order for the dissolution of the marriage, and Tabitha should have been mailed hers. At this point, the dude is slamming down papers. I mean, he's just like, he make it a fool. And the thing is, not that we want the jury to like him, but him and Nash both, are going to turn the jury just against the way they treat somebody as sweet as this witness is. I mean, he went hard on her. Nash the same way with Tabitha. As a person who's not like a lawyer or a judge, obviously, I look at things like a juror would look at things. And I'm going to sit here and tell you, they wouldn't win any favors from me. It's just, I can't stand. I mean, not that you convict somebody based on how slimy their lawyer is, but you know, it's just still, it's just, I don't understand why are you arguing with some girl and, and just got really at one point, I thought she was going to cry or just like burst out and tell him where he could kiss it. So they go through some tax papers that have George Wagner the fourth. And he said, it appears George was taking care of his taxes. And she said, it appears so. Um, he said, there are documents belonging to Angela in there. And she said, there are documents for all of them and they're intermingled. 
And he said, you don't have a list of all the documents for this tote? And she said, no. Um, he points out there's a document for Robin Wagner in there, and he asks about it. And she said, it appears that a lot of the Wagners use the same P.O. box, not just the four of them, but extent, you know, maybe his family as well. He asked, did you review or analyze any of the trail cameras? And she said, that's for the cyber crimes unit. But she did review some photos for telephones. He didn't go into that. Then he gets into the little drawings um, that came from the green notebook. And she said it had his name on it. I can't be certain it was his. And the defense says, right, you don't know if anything belongs to anybody. And you found the notebook with his name on it, right? And she said, well, yeah, but, you know, she couldn't tell. I mean, this poor girl, y'all. The Walmart receipt where the shoes were purchased. Um, tell me about those. She said there were two pairs, but there was a third pair on the receipt that was voided. So um, that's where I think he's going to say, you got three that allegedly went to the crime scene, and you got one pair that's voided, so maybe my client never wore the shoes at all. Because we, we've heard Jake say, Billy went into Chris Sr.'s. I'm telling you, wait for it, y'all. That's what's going to happen. Okay, so this finally, I tried to get a video of when he was walking away and the look she gave him, but I just couldn't get to it, y'all. I just, it, it was getting late. On redirect, you were asked if you inventoried the tub. The custody document reported to be written by Hannah May was on top and on the same tub that has George's tax returns and items belonging to George Wagner and was taken from his vehicle. She says yes. So she just hands her these tax documents from 2016 with George Wagner's that's on trial his name on him. She said she won't ask her to go through all the documents. That poor girl, like, literally to herself was like, thank God, I'm ready to go. Multiple Wagners are listed on documents. Are you aware of the income of George and Jake? And she said that on that particular document, that came from Wagner Trucking, and they were also doing business as some other name, but she couldn't recall it. And the prosecutor asked, George and Jake would drive together, and she said yes. Prosecutor says, you don't inventory those documents, but everything in that tote is scanned. And she said, yeah, every document was scanned by a team as they were received. And that's provided in discovery. And she says, yes, which means that Parker and Nash have looked at everything in that tub. Prosecution said the calendars, there were two different 2015 calendars. She said, yes, there was no additional cross. The last witness was really quick, Special Agent Jenkins. He was not there at the search warrant on May 12th, but he received from information to do a follow-up investigation at the Walmart in New Boston, Ohio. By the way, I realize when he, they say they send things to BCI London, it's not like England. It's London, Ohio. I was like, man, they've been sending ballistics to England for this case. Like England, like, you know, over there, over the pond. So she hands him a photo of a receipt sent to him with instructions to look up a SKU number. He goes to Walmart, talks to the customer service lady. And they had a little bit of a hard time trying to find this actual SKU number, but they found it was men's athletic shoes, but they couldn't tell him the size of the color. So what did they do? They check the database, start looking through the shoes. They found eventually going and physically looking at SKU numbers on the wall they found an exact match, and it was the gray Velcro shoes, 10 and a half and 11. Then he took pictures of the shoes and price tags with that same SKU number and gives it to investigators. So on cross, what does a SKU mean? <laughs> and he says they use it to identify merchandise. And then the defense, have you looked up a SKU before Walmart at Walmart? And he said no. Then the last question of the day, did you go to the Waverly Walmart, which is where Angela bought the shoes? And he said no, like it matters. It's the same SKU number. If I buy one from like Walmart in Oregon or Walmart in New England, it's going to be the same SKU number. So anyways, that was today's testimony. And uh, just, I don't know how I'm going to get through when the defense presents their case. I mean, because they're just, I don't know. Well, cross-exam at least, it won't be, you know. I don't know. We might see Angela open up. I mean, Angela, prosecutor. But still, yeah, I'm curious. But my big thing is this. I I have to think that they have something on George, and I think that's going to come in the form of these wiretaps. I can't think of anything else that they would have that would get him all these murder charges with death on the table until Jake confessed. So I'm hoping the wiretaps is going to be like the most interesting part 
of this trial and they can't opt out because they're recording. So we'll get to hear them. So anyways, that's it, guys. Uh, there is no court on Monday. They're out for the holidays. So we will not be doing an episode on this Monday. I may take that day off, actually, just to chill out. I haven't done that in a while. All right, you guys have an amazing weekend. Don't forget, Court TV, 7.30 a.m. on Sunday. If you're up that early, tune in. If not, I'll post a link on YouTube, all over social media when they put it up. They're, they're going to provide me with a link. So anyways, all right, guys, we'll see you soon. Happy weekend. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Jumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. <laughs> The Chumba Life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Lucky Land Casino. Asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.